Rancé, Chapter 18 of Shardick by Richard Adams On the edge of the forest, Rancé knelt over the tracks showing faintly in the hard ground. They led westward into the thick undergrowth, and where they disappeared, the bark of a kelmet tree had been slashed white, high up by the bear's claws. She knew that it was not two hours since Shardick had deliberately lain in wait for and killed a man. In this mood, he might well kill again might lie in wait for those who tracked him, or steal, elusive and silent, through the woods until he was behind them and the pursuers became the pursued. The strain of the past month had told increasingly upon the priestess. She was the oldest of the women who had followed Shardik down or Telga and across the Telferna Strait, and though her belief in his divine power was untouched by the least doubt, she had felt also, more and more as the days went by, the hardship of the life, and the continual fear of death. The young risk their lives heedlessly, often actually for sport, but their elders, even while they may grow in humility and selflessness, grow also in prudence and in regard for their own lives, those little portions of time in which they hope to create something fit to be offered at last to God. Rancé, novice mistress and warden of the ledges, had not, like Malathus, been caught unawares by the sudden coming of Shardik, like a thief in the night. From the moment when the Tuginda's message had reached Kiso, she had known what would be required of her. Since then, day after day, she had been driving her gaunt and aging body over the rocky hillsides and through the thickets of the island, struggling with her own fear even while she calmed some near-hysterical girl and persuaded her to take part once more in the singing, or herself took the girl's place and felt yet again the slow response of her muscles to the bear's lithe, unpredictable movements. On Kiso, Anthred, the woman struck down and killed among the trees by the shore, had been first her servant, then her pupil, and finally her closest friend. Once, in a dream, she had embraced her as her own child, and together they had dug up and burned that day in the rains, long ago, when Rancé's disappointed father— frightened at last by her waking fits, her swoons, and her voices that spoke and babbled from her at these times, had gone to the high baron to offer the, to the ledges his ugly, unmarriageable tent-pole of a daughter. She had recalled the dream as she performed the traditional rite of burning Anthrid's quiver, bow, and wooden rings upon her grave by the Telferna Strait. By what means was Shardick to be brought into the open and drugged insensible? And if the means she chose were faulty— how many lives would be lost with nothing to show? She returned to the girls, who were standing together a little way off, looking into the valley. When did he last eat? No one has seen him eat, madame, since he left Ortelga yesterday morning. Then he is likely to be looking for food now. The Tuginda and Lord Keldrek say he is to be drugged. Can we not follow him, madame, said Nito, and put down meat or fish with tessic hidden in it? Lord Keldrek says he must not fall asleep in the thick forest. If it can be accomplished, he is to return here. He will hardly return here, madame, said Nito, nodding her head towards the road below. At the foot of the slope, fires were already burning, and the sounds came up of many men at work, sudden cries of urgency or warning, the flat ringing of a hammer on iron, the gushing of flames fanned by a bellows, the rasp of a saw, the tap-tap-tap of a mallet and chisel. They could see Keldarek going from one group to another, conferring, pointing, nodding his head while he talked. As they watched, Sheldra left his side and came climbing quickly towards them. Impassive as usual, she showed no excitement or breathlessness as she stood before Rancé and raised her palm to her forehead. Lord Keldarek asks whether Shardik has yet gone far and what is to be done. He may well ask, and he a hunter— does he think Shardick is likely to stay near that stinking smoke and tumult? Lord Keldrek has ordered that some goats should be driven higher up the valley and tethered on the edge of the forest. He hopes that if Lord Shardick can be prevented from hunting or feeding elsewhere, he may perhaps make his way towards them, and that you may find means, madame, to drug him there. Go back and tell Lord Keldrek that if it can be done, we will find a way to do it with God's help. Zilfi, Nito, go back to the camp and... Bring up what meat you can find, and all the tessic that is there, the green leaves, as well as the dried powder. And you are to bring the other drug, too, the Teltokarna. 
"'But Totokarna can be administered only in a wound, madame, and not in food. "'It must be mingled with the blood.' "'I know that as well as you,' snapped Renze, "'and I have already told you to bring it. "'There are six or seven gallbladders packed with moss in a wooden box with a sealed lid. "'Handle it carefully. The bladders must not be broken. "'I will send back one of the other girls to meet you here "'and bring you on to join us, wherever we may be.' The long and dangerous search for Shardik, westward through the forest, continued until afternoon, and when, at last, Zilthi came running between the trees to say that she had caught sight of the bear prowling along the bank of a stream not far away, Ranse already felt herself on the point of collapse from strain and fatigue. She followed the girl slowly through a grove of myrtles and out into an expanse of tall yellow grass buzzing with insects in the sun. Here Zilthi pointed to the bank of the stream. Shardik gave no sign that he had seen them. He was fishing, splashing in and out of the water, and every now and then scooping out a fish to flap and jump on the stony bank before he held it down and ate it in two or three bites. Watching him, Rance's heart sank. To approach him was more than she dared attempt. The girls, she knew, would not refuse to obey her if she ordered them to do it. But what end would it serve? Suppose they could somehow succeed in startling him from the brook— what then? How were they to drive or entice him to return in the direction from which he had come? She went back to the trees and lay prone, her chin propped in her hands. The girls, gathering about her, waited for her to speak, but she said nothing. The shadows moved over the ground before her eyes, and the flies settled at the corners of her mouth. The heat was intense, but she gave no sign of discomfort, only now and then standing up to look at the bear, and then lying down as before. At length, Shardik left the stream and stretched himself out in a patch of great hemlock plants, not far from where the priestess was lying. She could hear the hollow sound of the stems as they snapped, and see the white umbels of bloom toppling and falling as the bear rolled among them. The silence returned and with it the weight of her impossible task and the agony of her determination. In her perplexed exhaustion she thought with envy of her friend, free at last from every burden, from the laborious dedication of the ledges and the continual fatigue and fear of the last weeks. If one had power to change the past, it was a favorite fantasy with her, though one which she had never shared, even with Anthrid. If she had power to change the past, at what point would she enter it to do so? At that night on the beach of Kiso a month ago, this time she would not guide them inland, but turn them back, the night messengers, the heralds of Shardik. It was dark. It was night. She and Anthred were standing once more on the stony beach with the flat green lantern between them, splashing the shallow water with their staves. Go back! she cried into the darkness. Go back! Return whence you came! You should never have come here! Ah, yes, I myself am the voice of God, and that is the message I am sent to deliver to you! She felt Anthred clutch at her arm, but pushed her aside. The windless, moonless darkness was thick about them. Only the sky retained a faint trace of light. Something was approaching, splashing slowly and heavily towards the shore. A huge black shape loomed above her, its lowered head turning from side to side, the mouth open, the breath floated and rank. She faced it imperiously. Once she and it had gone their several rays, then, ah, she would return with Anthred to find her girlhood, to turn its course away from Kiso forever. She raised her arm and was about to speak again, but the presence, with a soft, shaggy slapping of wet feet on the shore, passed by her and was gone into the wooded island. There was a blinding light and a noise of scolding birds. Rance looked about her in bewilderment. She was standing knee-deep in the dry, tawny grass. The sun was thinly covered with a fleece of cloud, and suddenly a long, distant roll of thunder ran round the edge of the sky. Some insect had stung her on the neck, and her fingers, as she drew them across the place, came away smeared with blood. She was alone. Anthred was dead, and she herself was standing in the dried-up, bitter forest south of the Telferna. The tears flowed silently down her haggard, dusty face as she bent forward, supporting herself upon her staff. After a few moments, she bit hard upon her hand, drew herself up, and gazed about her. 
Some distance away, Nito looked out from among the trees and then approached, staring at her incredulously. "'Madame, what? The bear? What have you done? Are you unharmed? Wait, lean on me. I—' "'Oh, I was afraid. I am so much afraid.' "'The bear,' said Rancé. "'Where's the bear?' As she spoke, she noticed for the first time a broad path flattened through the grass beside her, and on it, here and there, the tracks of shardic, broader than roof tiles. She bent down. The smell of the bear was plain. It could have passed only since she had last seen it among the hemlocks. Dazed, she raised her hands to her face and was about to ask Nito what had happened when she became conscious of yet one more bodily affliction. Her tears fell again. Tears of shame and degradation. Nito, I... I am going down to the stream. Go tell the girls to follow Lord Shardick at once. Then wait for me here. You and I will overtake them. In the water she stripped and washed her body and fouled clothes as well as she could. On Kiso it had been easier. Often Anthred had been able to perceive when one of her fits was coming on and had contrived to help her to save her dignity and authority. Now there was not one of the girls whom she could think of as her friend. Looking back, she caught a glimpse of Nito loitering discreetly among the trees. She would know what had happened, of course, and tell others. They must not be too long in catching up. Left to themselves, the girls would not be steady, and if by some incredible stroke of fortune Shardick were indeed to return whence he had come, nevertheless without herself they could not be relied upon to do their utmost, to death if necessary, to carry out the Duginda's instructions. She and Nito had not gone far when she realized that the fit had left her dulled and stupefied. She longed to rest. Perhaps, she thought, Shardick would stop or turn aside before the evening, and Lord Keldrek would be forced to allow them another day. But each time they came up with one or other of the girls waiting to show them the direction, the news was that the bear was still wandering slowly southeastward, as though making for the hill country below Gelt. Evening came on. Rancé's pace had become a limping hobble from one tree trunk to the next, yet still she exhorted Nito to keep her eyes open, to make sure of the right way forward, and to call from time to time in hope of hearing a reply from ahead. Vaguely, she was aware of twilight, of the fall of darkness, and later of moonlight among the trees, of intermittent thunder far off, and of swift momentary gusts of wind. Once she saw Anthred standing among the trees and was about to speak to her when her friend smiled, laid a ringed finger to her lips, and disappeared. At last, in the clear moonlight, at some mid-hour of the night, she looked about her and realized she had caught up with the girls. They were standing close together, in a whispering group, but as she approached, leaning on Nito's arm, they all turned towards her and fell silent. To her, their silence seemed full of dislike and resentment. If she had hoped for comradeship or sympathy at the end of this bitter journey, she was clearly to be disappointed. Handing her staff to Nito, she drew herself up, almost crying out as she put her full weight upon the broken blistered soles of her feet. "'Where's Lord Shardick?' "'Close at hand, madame. Not a bow shot away. He has been sleeping since moonrise.' "'Who is that?' said Rancé, appearing. "'Sheldra, I thought you were with Lord Keldrek. How do you come to be here? Where are we?' We are a little higher up the valley that you left this morning, madame, and on the edge of the forest. Zilthi came down to the camp to tell Lord Keldorek that Shardick had returned, but she was exhausted, so he sent me back instead of her. He says that Lord Shardick must be drugged tonight. Has any attempt been made to drug him? No one replied. Well? We have done all we could, madame, said another of the girls. We prepared two haunches of meat with Tessic and placed them as close to him as we dared— but he would not touch them. There is no more Tessic. We can only wait until he wakes. Before I left Lord Kelderick, madame, said Sheldra, a messenger arrived from Gelt, from Lord Tarkamunion. He sent word that he expected to fight the day after tomorrow, and that Shardick must come no matter what the cost. His words were, The hours now are more precious than stars. From the hills to southward the lightning flickered between the trees. Rancé limped the few yards to the edge of the forest and looked out across the valley. The sound of the brook below wavered on the air. Away to her left she could see the fires of the camp where the Tuginda and Keldrek must at this moment be waiting for news. She thought of the black shape that had passed her in the noonday night, 
through the watery shallows of the grass, and of Anthred smiling among the trees, her hands adorned with the plated rings that she herself had burned by the shore. These signs were clear enough. The situation was, in fact, a simple one. All that was required was a priestess who knew her duty and was capable of carrying it out with resolution. She returned to the girls. They drew back from her, staring silently in the dimness. You say Lord Shardick is close at hand. Where? Someone pointed. Go and make sure that he is still sleeping, said Ransay. You should not have left him unwatched. You are all to blame. Madame. Be silent, said Ransay. Nito, bring me the box of Thetulkarna. She drew her knife and tested it. The sharp edge sliced lightly through a leaf held between her finger and thumb, while the point, with the least pressure upon it, almost pierced the skin of her wrist. Nito was standing before her with the wooden box. Rance stared coldly down at the girl's trembling fingers, and then at the knife held motionless in her own steady hand. Come with me. You too, Sheldra. She took the box. She remembered the last time that she and Anthred had walked through fire in the courtyard of the Upper Temple, on the night when they had led Keldrek to the Bridge of the Suppliants. There was an unreality about the memory, as though it were not hers but some other woman's. The night sound seemed magnified about her. The dry forest echoed through caves of dripping water, and her body felt like a mass of hot sand. These were symptoms she recognized. She would need to be quick. Her fear was somewhere behind her, searching for her, overtaking her among the trees. The bear was stretched on its side in a thicket of chinchillada saplings, two of which he had pushed down and snapped in making a place to sleep. A few feet away lay one of the haunches of meat. Whoever had put it there had not lacked courage. The huge mass of the body was dappled with moonlight and leaf shadows. The shaggy flank rising and falling in sleep, and overlaid with the speckled moving light, appeared like a dark plain of grass. Before the half-open, breathing mouth, the leaves on one of the broken branches stirred and glistened. The claws of one extended forepaw were curved upward. Rance stood a few moments, gazing as though at a deep, swift river into which she must now plunge and drown. Then, motioning the girls away, she stepped forward. She was standing against the ridge of Shardik's back, looking over his body, as though from behind an earthwork, at the restless, wind-moved forest. The thunder muttered in the hills, and Shardik stirred, twitched one ear, and then once more lay still. Rance thrust her left hand deep into the pelt. She could not lay bare the skin, and began cutting away the oily hair, matted and full of parasites as a sheep's fleece. Her own hands were trembling now, and she worked faster, lifting each handful carefully, cutting, and then drawing it away from under the sharp knife. Soon she had cut a wide, bristling patch across the shoulder, almost bearing the grey, salt-flake skin. Two or three veins ran across it, one thick enough to reveal the slow beating of the pulse. Rance turned and stooped for the box beside her. Taking out two of the little oiled bladders, she placed them between the fingertips of her left hand. Then she drove the point of the knife into the bear's shoulder and drew the blade back towards her, opening a gash half as long as her own forearm. Smoothly, without a pause, she pushed the bladders into it, drew the edges of the incision over them, pressed downwards, and felt them crush inside. With a snarl, Shardik threw back his head and rose upon his hind legs. Rance flung to the ground, got up and stood facing him. For a moment it seemed that he would strike her down. Then, lurching forward, he crushed her against his body. A few steps he carried her, hanging grotesquely in his grip. Then, letting her drop, limp as an old garment fallen from a line, he staggered out to the open slope beyond the trees. He rolled on the ground and froth flew from his mouth as he bit and tore at the grass. Sheldra was the first to reach the priestess. Her left hand had been gashed by her own knife, her tongue protruded, and her head lay grotesquely upon her shoulder like that of a hanged man. When Sheldra put one arm beneath her and tried to raise her, a terrible crackling sound came from the broken body. The girl laid her back, and for a moment she opened her eyes. Till the Tuginda did what she said, 
blood gushed from her mouth, and when it ceased, her gaunt, bony body vibrated very lightly, like the surface of a pool fluttered by the wings of a trapped fly. The movement ceased, and Sheldra, perceiving that she was dead, drew off her wooden rings, picked up the box of Theltokana and the fallen knife, and made her way out to the slope, where Shardik lay insensible.